asking me about the American mystery novels she enjoyed, as well as the latest Booker Prize winner, Vernon God Little, which she said, is very funny and captures the craziness of your country much like Gunter Grass did with Germany in the Tin Drum. You should read it, Alex. I live it, I told Clara. It was only at the end of the meal that the kids admitted that the names for the breakfast foods were just about the only Czech words they knew. Then they began to clear away the food and started in on the dishes. Oh, and there's Tveitsa Sahunusni, said Yosef, or Joe, the eight-year-old. I'm almost afraid to ask. What does that mean? Oh, that the eggs were gross, said Joe, who laughed with little boy delight at his joke. Chapter 68 There was nothing to do once I left Martin and Clara's, except obsess and worry about the wolf and where he might strike, if he was going to retaliate. Back at the hotel, I caught a few more hours of sleep. Then I decided to walk, and I felt that this might be a long walk. I needed it. Something strange, though. I was strolling along Broadway, and I had the feeling that somebody was following me. I didn't think I was being paranoid. I tried to see who it was, but either he was very good, or I wasn't that skilled at spy games. Maybe if this had been Washington instead of London. But it was difficult for me to spot who or what was out of place here. Except me, of course. I stopped in at Scotland Yard, and there was still no word from the wolf. And so far, no reprisals. Not in any of the targeted cities. The calm before the storm... An hour or so later, having walked up Whitehall, past Number 10 Downing Street to Trafalgar Square and back, and feeling much better for the exercise, I made my way to the hotel and had that same creepy feeling again, as if someone was watching me, following. Who? I didn't actually see anyone. Back in my room, I called the kids at Aunt Tia's. Then I talked to Nana, who was on Fifth Street by herself. Oddly peaceful, but I wouldn't mind a full house again. I miss everybody. So do I, Nana. I fell off to sleep again in my clothes and didn't wake until the phone rang. I hadn't bothered to pull the drapes and it was dark outside. I looked at the clock. Jesus, four in the morning? I guess I was finally catching up on some of the sleep I'd lost. Alex Cross, I said into the phone. It's Martin, Alex. I'm on my way from home. He wants us to go to the Houses of Parliament to meet him on the sidewalk outside the stranger's entrance. Shall I pick you up? No, it's faster if I walk. I'll meet you there. Parliament at this time of the morning? It didn't sound good. Maybe five minutes later, I was back outside again, hurrying along Victoria Street, heading toward Westminster Abbey. I was certain that the wolf was going to pull something and that it would hurt like hell. Did that mean all four cities were about to be hit? That wouldn't surprise me. Nothing would at this point. Hello, Alex. Fancy meeting you here. A man stepped out of the shadows. I hadn't even noticed him standing there. Preoccupied, maybe only half awake, a little careless. He stepped all the way out of the shadows and I saw his gun. It was pointed at my heart. I'm supposed to be out of the country by now, but I had this one thing I had to do. Uh, Kill you. I wanted you to see it coming, too. Just like this. I've had dreams about this moment. Maybe you have, too. The speaker was Geoffrey Schaefer. He was so cocky and confident, and he clearly had the upper hand. Maybe that's why I didn't even think about what I should do, and I didn't hesitate. I barreled into Schaefer, waited for the thundering gunshot to follow. It came, too. Only he didn't hit me, at least I didn't think so. I suspected the shot was deflected to the side. Didn't matter. I blocked Schaefer hard into the building behind him. I saw surprise and pain in his eyes, and that was the motivation I needed. Also, his gun had gone flying in the scuffle. I hit him hard with a roundhouse in his midsection, probably below the belt, maybe a nut cruncher. I hope so. He grunted and I knew I'd hurt him, but 
but I wanted to hurt Schaefer more for all kinds of reasons. I wanted to kill him right there in the street. I crunched another shock to his stomach and I could feel it go weak under my fist. Then I went for the bastard's head. I slammed a hard right hand into his temple, then a left to his jaw. He was hurt badly, but he wouldn't go down. That all you got, Cross? Here's something for you. He had a switchblade and I started to step away. But then I realized that he was hurt and that this was my best chance. I hit Schaefer again on his nose. Broke it. He still wouldn't go down and he swiped out viciously with a knife. He sliced my arm and I realized how crazy I was. How lucky not to be hurt or killed. I had a chance to reach for my own gun and I pulled it out of the holster on the back of my belt. Schaefer charged at me and I'm not sure if he saw the gun. Maybe he thought I wouldn't be armed in London. No! I yelled. It was all I had time to say. I fired point blank into his chest. He fell back against the wall and slowly slid to the ground. His face was nothing but shock, as maybe he realized that he was mortal after all. Fucker. Cross. Bastard. I bent down over him. Who is the wolf? Where is he? Go to hell, he said. And then he died, and went there instead. Chapter 69 Chapter 69 London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Minutes after the weasel died on the streets of London, his old army mate, Henry Seymour, drove an eleven-year-old white van through the night, and he was thinking that he had no fear of death, none at all. He welcomed it, actually. At a little past 4.30, traffic was already heavy on the Westminster Bridge. Seymour parked as close to it as he could, then walked back and rested his arms on the parapet, looking west. He loved the sight of Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament from the grand old bridge, always had, ever since he was a small boy visiting London on day trips from Manchester, where he'd been raised. He was noticing everything this morning. On the opposite bank of the Thames, he saw the London Eye, which he thoroughly despised. The Thames was as dark as the early morning sky. The smell in the air was slightly salty and fishy. Rows of plum-colored tourist buses sat idle near the bridge, waiting for the day's first passengers to arrive in just an hour or so. Isn't going to happen, though. Not on this day of days. Not if old Henry had his way this morning. Wordsworth had written of the view from Westminster Bridge. He thought it was Wordsworth. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Henry Seymour always remembered that one though he wasn't much for poets or what they had to say. Write a poem about this shit. Somebody write a poem about me. The bridge and poor Henry Seymour and all these other poor bastards out here with me this morning. He went to fetch the van. At 5.34, the bridge seemed to ignite at its center. Actually, Henry Seymour's van was what blew up. The strip of roadway beneath it rose up and then split apart. The bridge's supports toppled. Triple-globed lampposts flew into the air like uprooted flowers blowing in the fiercest wind anyone could imagine. For a moment, everything was quiet, deathly quiet, as Seymour's spirit floated away. Then police sirens began to scream all over London and the wolf called Scotland Yard to take credit for his handiwork. Unlike you people, I keep my promises. I try to build bridges between us, but you keep tearing them down. Do you understand? Do you finally understand what I'm saying? The London Bridge is gone, and it's only the beginning. This is too good to end. I want it to go on and on. Payback. Part four. Part four. Paris. Paris. Scene of the crime. 
Chapter 70. Chapter 70. The test track was a familiar one, located 60 kilometers south of Paris. The wolf was there to drive a prototype race car, and he had some company for the ride. Walking beside him was a former KGB man who had handled his business in France and Spain for many years. His name was Ilya Frolov, and Ilya knew the wolf by sight. He was one of the few men still alive who did, which filled him with some dread, though he thought of himself as one of the wolf's few friends. What the beauty, the wolf said as the men walked up beside a red Porsche-powered prototype fab car. This very model had run in a Rolex sports car series. You love your cars, Ilya said. Always have. Growing up outside Moscow, I never thought they would own a car, any car. Now I own so many that I lose count sometimes. I want you to take a ride with me. Get in, my friend. Ilya Frolov shook his head and raised both hands in protest. Uh, not me. I don't like the noise, the speed, anything about it. I insist, said the wolf. He raised the gull wing on the passenger side first. Go ahead. It won't bite you. You'll never forget the ride, Ilya. Ilya forced a laugh, then started to cough. <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of. After we finish, I want to talk to you about the next steps. We're very close to getting our money. They're weakening day by day, and I have a plan. You're going to be a rich man, Ilya. The wolf climbed into the driver's seat, which was on the right side. He flipped a switch. The dashboard lit up, and the car roared and shook. The wolf watched Ilya's face go pale and laughed merrily. In his own strange way... He loved Ilya Frolov. We're sitting right on the engine. It's going to get very hot in here now. Maybe a hundred and thirty degrees. That's why we wear a cool suit. It's going to get noisy, too. Put on your helmet, Ilya. Last warning. And then they were off. The wolf lived for this. The exhilaration, the raw power of the world's finest race cars... At this speed, he had to concentrate on the driving. Nothing else mattered. There was nothing else while he spun around the test track. Everything about the ride was about power, the noise, since there was no sound-dampening material inside, the vibration, the stiffer the suspension, the faster the car could change direction, the G-force, resulting in as much as 600 pounds of pressure on some turns. God, what a glorious machine, so perfect, whoever made it was a genius. There are still some of us in the world, he thought to himself, I should know. Finally, he slowed and steered the highly temperamental car off the track. He climbed out, pulled off his helmet, shook out his hair, and shouted to the skies, That was so great! My God, what an experience! Experience better than sex. I've ridden women and cars. I prefer the race car. He looked over at Ilya Frolov and saw that the man was still pale and shaking a bit. Poor Ilya. Oh, I'm sorry, my friend, the wolf spoke softly. I'm afraid you don't have the balls for the next ride. Besides, you know what happened in Paris. He shot his friend dead on the test track. Then the wolf just walked away, never looking back. He had no interest in the dead. Chapter 71. Chapter 71. That same afternoon, the wolf visited a farmhouse about 50 kilometers southeast of the test track. He was the first to arrive and settled in the kitchen, which he kept as dark as a crypt. Arthur Nikitin had been ordered to come alone, and he did as he was told. Nikitin was former KGB and had always been a loyal soldier. He worked for Ilya Frolov, mostly as an arms dealer. The wolf heard Arthur approaching on the back steps. No lights, he called. 
Just come inside. Arthur Nikitin opened the door and stepped inside. He was tall, with a thick white beard, a big Russian...